So how does a cancer doctor make all these millions of dollars? Well, it's not off of office visits because they don't see nearly as many people a day as we do. No, we see And not by so. recommending surgery because many oncologists don't do the surgery. They send them out to surgeons to have these things done. Exactly. They make the millions off of recommending and then administering inside their clinic the chemotherapy. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Jack. And Mary. And welcome back to the Forbidden Doctor podcast. This is podcast episode 158. What do oncologists make on chemotherapy? The forbidden information you are not allowed to know. So today we're going to talk about some forbidden information that has really not been hidden from you, but you probably don't know about it. And we are taking a lot of our information from an interview with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez a few months before he died. Yeah. And this information needs to continue on. And what we're going to talk about is how a particular branch of modern medicine has a license to make hundreds of billions of dollars a year off of your fear. Mm. But before we get to that, for our regular listeners, the next four minutes is our financial stuff. So you can fast forward through it if you choose. But for our new listeners, yes. please listen at least one time so you understand how we do things around here. So before we begin this informative and forbidden podcast, we want to take a few minutes to talk about why we do not have sponsors. Yeah, we've been approached many times to sell different products on our show. But we've always been compelled to resist these financially tempting offers because many times they lead to an attempt for editorial control over what we say. Yeah, and what we're doing here is too important to be controlled by corporate interests. So we never allow this kind of advertising no. on our show. And so that said, we don't make money from these podcasts. All of Not our income all. comes from your interaction with us and what we have to offer and from the sale of our Forbidden Doctor products and supplements from the oldest and original whole food supplement manufacturer in the United States, Standard Process. Yeah. But we're not paid by standard process. Indeed, they distance themselves from open internet promotion because of constant scrutiny from the FDA. Yeah, and as a result, they do not advertise or pay for advertising outside of a licensed healthcare professional's office. And the reason for this is really simple, because their products are very powerful and they actually work. Yeah. So they need to be careful about people making claims. Others have mentioned that while the knowledge we share can't be found anywhere else, it is often tied to standard process. Yeah, and that also includes our own ageless yes, thyroid and does. long life energy enzymes products. Yes, and so you might ask, could not our own products be creating a conflict of interest? Mm -hmm. I mean, have we mistakenly created infomercials instead of free knowledge podcasts? No, we do this on purpose. Yes, because years of experience on the radio and in our clinics and almost half a million downloads of our podcasts have taught us a few things. And the most important is that the type of nutrient-dense foods that most of us need to get our bodies actually healing from years of malnutrition are not easily integrated into most of our lives. Yeah, the quest for excellence in nutrition has never been an easy task. Just, just face it, nobody wants to eat raw liver. Uh -uh. But absolutely no one will sign up to eat raw liver daily for six months. So we feel therapeutic supplementation is sometimes yes. very critical in the healing process. Yes, it is. So let us be clear. We talk about standard process because this is how you can get whole foods in a concentrated form that you would never, ever eat on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do our podcast this way is because it has saved our lives and countless others that we've worked with over the years. Yeah, so we sell supplements. Yeah. And so we try to give free knowledge away about how nutrition touches every aspect of our lives. And so necessarily these two are going to overlap. But the bottom line is we may mention supplements that you can get from our website, but the knowledge we share is real. And you can take that with you forever, whether or not you ever buy anything from us. But you can support us in keeping this podcast on the air with a donation at ForbiddenDoctor.com slash donate. Yes. Or if you're ready to take your first steps for your own health, you can join our family by going to our website and taking our free symptom survey. Now, we understand, we really do, that some of you may feel real hardship with even a modest purchase and cannot afford even a single month's supply of supplements. So please know then, it is completely okay if you do not buy our supplements 
or financially support our show in any way if you cannot afford to. Yes. However, there are many ways to support us for free. You can give us a five-star rating on iTunes. That's easy. Or a thumbs up on YouTube. Where, wherever you listen to our podcast, just give us a good rating. Yeah, and if you already support the show, thank you, truly thank you. And please know that you are the very reason we fight this good fight. I mean, your support makes this all possible. So now let's get back to the forbidden information they don't want you to know. Oh, yeah. So let's get started. Let's begin by talking a bit about how chemotherapy was first developed. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fascinating story, which most oncologists don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, um, during World War II, the Department of Defense had all these stockpiles of nerve gas which were left over from World War I. Mm. And they weren't using them in World War II, you know, the Geneva Conventions and stuff, and the That's humanity. Yes. yes, and someone at the Department of Defense um, had this brilliant idea one day to try and convert these nerve gases into some useful therapeutic modality. <laughs> That's a big leap. Yeah, <laughs> and serendipitously, at the same time, it turned out that a group of American soldiers were inadvertently exposed to, to some nerve gas. Is, at is a, it mustard gas, right? At the same, the same mustard gas material at an experimental research center, and what they noticed at their autopsy was... <laughs> because these soldiers died. Yes, is that their white blood cell counts had all gone down and their normal bone marrow had been suppressed. So one of the Department of Defense doctors got this yes. brilliant idea about around 1945 that perhaps you could treat cancer using nerve gas. Now, don't you wake up in the morning <laughs> with ideas like that? Well, yeah. hey, you know, cancer's a nasty thing. You well, know? They, they tried what's called nitrogen mustard. Now, that's the technical name for mustard gas, but because it was delivered by gas. It can be delivered intravenously, interestingly enough. Yeah. But they delivered it by gas in World War I, so it was called mustard gas. So they tried this nitrogen mustard, and they used it to treat leukemia and lymphoma. And what it did was to knock out the bone marrow where the leukemias and the lymphomas began, yeah. which are, of course, diseases of the white blood cells. And amazingly, the nerve gas seemed to kill the cancer. Kind of a scorched earth policy. Oh, gosh, know, yes. Kind of like antibiotics, just psh, yes. kill everything. So in 1946, the Department of Defense actually contracted Dr. Gilman at Yale University, who then at the time was the preeminent pharmacologist of the day, and they gave them this huge amount of money to test it in an animal mode, and lo and behold, the tumors regressed. Mm, of course, the animals all died. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was very impressive, as this was the very first time in history that anyone had ever seen cancerous tumors regressed from a drug oh, yeah. treatment. I mean, this was stunning. Yeah. So they, hmm, what do we do now? Let's <laughs> try it on a human being. Wow. <laughs> which they did, and they had a patient with advanced lymphoma, and as there were no treatments for lymphoma in 1946, they gave him this nitrogen mustard derivative. And lo and behold, all his tumors regressed, which they thought was a, a miracle. A miracle. Yes. Yeah, miracle drug. Yes. So six weeks later, this poor guy, he was dead. Yes. But it was an extraordinary event because it was the first time in medical history that doctors had witnessed mm -hmm. and documented the regression of tumors in a patient with an advanced disease. See, this is like when uh, Alexander Fleming happened to notice that his little colony of bacteria, once the mold from the skin of the orange fell into the dish, it killed the bacteria. And that went on to discover penicillin. penicillin. How shocking that was to him accidentally. Well, here... They're having the same experience. So they tweaked the formula, obviously, because they can't keep killing people with it. <laughs> six weeks. He, he lived six weeks. He, he lived for six weeks. Yeah. But before he died, his tumors regressed. Yeah. So they started playing around with the formula. And over the next 10, 15 years, they gradually developed a variety of drugs. And it all began at Yale. And then this went to other medical centers where they were using these toxic chemicals for healing, derived ironically... From, from deadly nerve gas. Nerve gas, yeah. Remember, it was, it was nerve gas, mustard yeah. gas. That, yes. That's what they called it, was mustard gas. And it was used to kill people in World War I. But now it is used as a therapeutic modality in chemotherapy. Right, and very few people realize that the whole generation of chemotherapeutic drugs that are being used today, which is more than 100 of them, 
really developed from poisonous nerve gas that was developed for warfare. Wow, that's how it all began. It didn't develop out of anything good. You know, its origins are, you know, pretty unpleasant, but that's how it all began. I mean, that's, that's it. That's the Department of Defense contracting doctors to use their nitrogen mustard stores to see if they could use it to treat any kind of disease. Yeah. I mean, I mean how do you throw away deadly gas? You know, you can burn it in a furnace, but why don't we make drugs out of it? <laughs> so, you know, so why was the medical community so excited about something like this? Well, when Goodman and Gilman published their results with the animal studies that were showing success with these um, aggressive lymphomas in these animals. And when they published their first case report of a single human being, the medical community was absolutely enthralled because they didn't know at that time of any drug that could reduce tumors. And so this was the first time in history where drug therapy, a synthetic drug, mind you, mm-hmm. had reduced tumors, and it was just an amazing event in medicine. It was, all, it was in all the newspapers. Yep. Um, there was no internet in those days, but it really spread all across the world that cancer's magic bullet was right around the corner. Yes, and antibiotics at that time, you know, were really coming into their own, and so a lot of it had to do with the general context of the time with the enthusiasm about antibiotics, which really came to their own during World War II. I mean, you know, the early soldiers back then with with injuries using antibiotics could reverse terrible infections. Yeah, it saved many lives. Yeah, so the researchers were, well, if we found one magic bullet, we can find another one. Mm -hmm. So a drug that would cause tumors to go away just the way antibiotics were curing infectious diseases like pneumonia and terrible infections, which previously had no treatment. Yeah, they thought they had it. Yep. They thought that this nitrogen mustard derivative was the next penicillin for cancer. And just as everything had come together with these extraordinary, effective antibiotics, which, of course, was very overstated. Was very overstated. Um, they didn't talk about the side effects of what else it killed. But with this one case report, they said, we have the magic bullet for cancer. Yeah, but as it turned out... The research was very slow in coming, and, and proving results with most of the cancers turned out to be very difficult, and chemotherapy actually got started as a sort of standard method of treatment for cancer after the initial enthusiasm from the um, mid-1940s yeah. from the mustard gas. Yeah. So instead of going through lots of trials and experimentation and development and everything that drugs have to go through today, they said, well, let's just start doing it. That'll be our trials. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like they do on vaccinations, too. So. Yeah, and it was a really a very slow process because a lot of the initial enthusiasm had been tainted by the fact that most patients weren't responding in waiting for the tumor to shrink. And because of that, the, the patient would end up dying. Yeah, it wasn't until the late 1960s that the idea that chemotherapy could have this magical effect on cancer really came into the fore again because of all these people dying. Yeah, so they, they started trying it on all these different cancers, and it was only the, a few of them that responded. Which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk does, about that It does here. work well on a few cancers. Yeah, and it was this single incident uh, with the development of the MOP, uh, not the dust mop mm-hmm. or the floor mop, but the MOPP. It's an acronym. Yeah, it's an acronym for the for the for these uh, component drugs that make up the regimen that they were using for Hodgkin's disease, mustardin and mechlorethamine and chlormethine and mustine and nitrogen mustard and oncovin, which is also known as vincristine, which interestingly enough is patterned after a chemical in the flower periwinkle. Huh. And the Asians and the Indians have been using periwinkle extract for cancer treatment of Hodgkin's for a long, long time. Wow. So the pharmaceutical companies took a look at the periwinkle, like they do almost every plant that has curative and synthesize it. qualities. And then they synthesize it. And that's where MOP came from. And it, it's a treatment for Hodgkin's disease. It was developed by a Dr. Vincent DeVita, who at that time... Um, was working at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And he was studying Hodgkin's disease, and he put a variety of chemotherapy drugs that had been already developed in the 1960s into this four-drug regimen. And he started treating advanced Hodgkin's disease and lymphoma, and it, man, it was like 1946 (laughs) all over again. This was in the 1960s. Right, where all these tumors magically disappeared. Ah. Because remember, from 46, when they started using mustard gas on... Uh, other kinds of 
cancer, it didn't work. Right. And so the, oh. So it kind of fell out and the then. Bo- the balloon deflated. But when he put this together, because he just happened to be studying Hodgkin's disease, suddenly the tumors regressed and boy, happy days are here again. It's back to 1946. Well, some of the Hodgkin patients had long... The, the results were long-standing. In other words, they seemed to be cured. Yes, because so, of his treatment. Right. So this was the first time that there was a significant long-term effect from synthetic toxic chemicals. <laughs> and Dr. DeVita deserves credit for that. I mean, we ought to give the devil his due. Well, yes. And, and it did work for a lot of these Hodgkin patients. Up to 50% of the advanced cases seemed to respond beautifully for long periods of time. Yes, there was toxicity and side effects. Obviously, that was there. But Dr. DeVita's work with Hodgkin's really prompted a a rebirth, a a whole new enthusiasm for chemo in the 1960s. Yeah, because a lot of the enthusiasm from the 1940s had waned, right? Yes, right. Because they just weren't getting the results that they thought they would. And Dr. DeVita really revived this whole new interest in the use of these toxic synthetic medications in the treatment of cancer. Yeah, it was like like you said, 1946, all over again. Yep. Because... Listen, Hodgkin's is a very unique disease and is one of only a few out of 100 cancers that responds well to chemo. Yeah, and it just happened to be the disease that he was working on. And it just happened to be one of the few cancers that actually responds to toxic chemotherapy drugs. But again, as they did in 1946... The oncology establishment just went on to generalize. Yeah, they assumed if chemotherapy could work so effectively for Hodgkin's disease, which in those days, of course, was a deadly disease, it must work for everything else, for all the other cancers. But that was an assumption that wasn't warranted. I mean, it turned out to be deadly and erroneous and not right. But because of Dr. DeVita's work and his work specifically with Hodgkin's disease and specifically his work with the MOP, M-O-P-P, Uh, You can uh, Google that. You can go to Wikipedia and read about all the drugs. Uh, Because of that regimen, there was this burst of news in all the newspapers and magazines, news reports, medical journals. It just showed up everywhere. So the question at this point, obviously, is why is chemotherapy so ineffective than for most types of cancers, what what are known as the hard cancers, especially at the stage four level? Yeah, there are over 100 different types of cancers. Uh, depending on which textbook you consult, and the great, great majority of them do not, I repeat, do not respond to chemotherapy. Yeah, and, and as it turns out, the cancers that respond to chemo are generally the, the, uh, the blood-related cancers like leukemia and lymphoma and multiple myeloma, and they're not all that common compared to the major cancer killers. Yeah, these, those types of cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, they're what's known as soft cancers, yeah. not tumors. right. So the major cancer killers like lung, colon, prostate, pancreatic, breast, these cancers do not respond that well to to chemotherapy, if at all. And these are the solid or hard tumors as opposed to a soft or blood tumor. Ironically enough, though, it's the failure of so many types of chemo for hard cancers that has created this new wave of immunotherapy. Oh, that is the new buzzword? We did a podcast on this. Yes, and it's everywhere now. Yeah, and the truly ironic part is that it is just this immunotherapy approach that's behind the marvelous anti-cancer mechanisms inside of your own immune system that keeps cancer at bay for all of us. Right, and so the, the question they're examining now is why does this person who we can find cancer cells in the bloodstream but no active cancer anywhere, and this person who's got cancer cells in their bloodstream but they've got metastatic cancer in four different places in their body, what's the difference? Suppressed immune system Mm -hmm. is what they're coming up with. So rather than finding out the lifestyle of the person who is completely free of cancer as opposed to the person filled with it, they want to go to develop drugs that will enhance the immune response in people where the immune system is sluggish. Which allows them to make money. Get, so the money continues to flow. The cancer, and the so. only reason they're doing that is because chemo doesn't work. If chemo worked, they wouldn't be spending right. a dime on that research. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, you know, same with antibiotics. You know, it works. Um, you can take garlic, and it's a natural antibiotic, but it doesn't work as well in a crisis situation. So, yeah, and so but it's they the, couldn't find anything like that. Yeah, for hard cancers. So to repeat here, or to you know catch up here, it's the rare cancers like Hodgkin's and some rare cancers like lymphomas and leukemias and, and multiple myeloma that tend to respond to chemotherapy very nicely. Yeah, they're. There's interesting reasons and all kinds of theories about why chemo works. I mean, admittedly. When it does work. Yeah, when it does work and why it doesn't work when it doesn't. You know, and and actually chemotherapy, as the 1946 study shows, wipes out the bone marrow. Yeah. And with it, the leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myeloma, and the cancers that do respond to chemo. These are the the cancers that that respond to chemo. Yeah, they're the diseases of the bone marrow. Right. And then, back then as now... Using toxic chemo, you're actually knocking out the bone marrow. So, of course, these diseases will regress and the patient improves, and sometimes with these terrible diseases, permanently. Sometimes they're cured. Yeah, but the other solid tumors, the the major cancer killers, like tumors of the breast and the lung, they're not bone marrow cancers. So you can wipe out the bone marrow with the chemo, but these hard cancers are still going to grow because these cancers don't derive from bone marrow stem cells. So for the great majority of the major cancer killers, chemotherapy is simply ineffective. Yeah, I hope you guys all got that. That's really critical. Well, you know, it's the bone marrow that makes the white and the red blood cells. And it's the white blood cells arising from the bone marrow stem cells that lost their regulatory mechanism, and they create these soft cancers. By soft, we can also say blood cancers. Blood cancers, right. By using and then and then of course by using chemotherapy over time, these these dysregulated. in uh, undifferentiated, crazy, gone nut bone marrow stem cells are removed and destroyed, so the soft cancer usually regresses. Now, we did a bunch of so- um, podcasts on, about cancer, and we talked about, and this may be new to some of you out there, that cancers usually come from stem cells, not from old cells that lost their regulatory control. Yeah, they went Alzheimer's on you. They went Alzheimer's. They don't continue to divide. It's it's the stem cells, the ones that replace old and worn-out cells, that lose their regulation and don't become that new liver cell. They become... They don't differentiate. They stay undifferentiated. Undifferentiated, and then divide and divide and become rogue. And that's where... And more and more of the latest... Uh, literature research. on cancer research is saying, hey, it's we've been <laughs> we've been looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Well, this chemotherapy is also really scary. Yeah. And they've been looking at that for 80 years. So anyway, and this is one of the major side effects of chemo for heart cancers, wiping out the very area of the body from where your white blood cells that fight cancer and infections are made, the bone marrow. Yeah. So when you do the chemo, for hard cancers, yep. let's make that clear. For hard cancers, it wipes out your immune system. Well, it does for the soft cancers, too. Right. But the, the good thing curative. about the soft cancers is it gets rid of the cause of the soft <laughs> cancer. So anytime you're going to wipe out the bone marrow, which is what mustard gas does, or the mop, or some of these other... Uh, we're going to talk about some of the other drugs here in a minute. Um, uh, a lot of times there's immunosuppression that goes on. Your immune system is suppressed... And you have to be very careful when you're on chemo to stay away from sick people. Yeah, they always say, don't visit me, I'm on chemo. Yep. Too too many people we know are on chemo. So So before we go on and talk more about this, I want to bring up the free symptom survey that we offer on the homepage at ForbiddenDoctor.com. It's the most comprehensive survey you'll ever take. This goes very foundational instead of chasing symptoms. It has tons of questions. And after you're done, you have the opportunity to have a free, 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 30-minute phone consultation with one of our nutritionists. And you'll be given a personalized protocol that that you have no obligation to buy, but you'll still get it because that saves you money in the long run because you're not taking supplements you don't need. And all of this up to this point is at no charge to you. Yeah, and if you decide to purchase the recommended supplements, you can get them at a 10% discount if you'll sign up for our text blast. Yeah, these text blasts give you fantastic coupons every single week. Just text the word HEALTHY to 41411. And we'll text you back a coupon code, which you can use on our website, ForbiddenDoctor.com, when you check out. Or you can just call the office at 801-523-1890, and they can help you sign up for the next text blast. And remember, your patronage of our offers keeps this podcast on the air. So let's 
get to the heart and core of what we want to talk about. And that is this, that there is a special area of medicine that has allowed certain privileges that no other branch of medicine enjoys, and that is oncology, cancer treatment. Cancer. Now, the word's etymological uh, origin is the Greek word onkos, which means tumor, and ology, of course, which means the knowledge, study of, that kind of thing. So it's the study of tumors. Oncology Oncology means the study of tumors. Um, Now... Most people, most people are paying for their cancer treatments with their insurance programs. But do you know how expensive chemotherapy really is? No, 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 no. Most people don't because they don't have to pay for it. Yeah. And those without insurance, well, this Mm -hmm. is the number one reason for bankruptcy in our country. Medical costs often arising from cancer treatment. But we all have the idea, if we have insurance, that it's free because the insurance or Medicare will pay for it. But in actuality, we're all paying for this. It's not free. And people have no idea how expensive this is. And I mean at its worst form, a bone marrow transplant. Which which, doesn't work very well. Which is hours and hours long, can cost up to a million dollars. And it doesn't really work that much for most cancers, as you said. Yeah. And a drug like Avastin, a chemotherapy drug like Avastin, which was heralded as the great advancement in chemotherapy, you know, even the FDA had to take it off the market after only two years after it was approved in 2008. They removed it in 2010 for the treatment of breast cancer. They rescinded its approval for breast cancer because oh, oh. it wasn't working. Imagine that. Even though the doctors were still using still it. Using it Avastin was $10,000 a month. Yeah. So, and, and in my discussions with some medical people, and I, I take care of medical people in my practice, if you want to make money in medicine, you become a conventional oncologist. I mean, these guys are multimillionaires. And there are oncology clinics that bring in millions of dollars because yeah. these drugs are terribly expensive. And what patients do not realize, what they do not realize, and the media does not realize, and this is the point of this, is that oncologists are allowed to make money off the sale of chemo in their office. Uh, you can Google the whole idea, but if you Google cancer docs profit from chemotherapy drugs, there's a whole bunch of articles and stuff that came out several years ago about this. They have a vested interest in using these drugs, even in situations where it's not that effective because they make money. Yeah, the New York Times had an article several years ago which pointed out that oncologists make hundreds of thousands of dollars each year themselves off the sale of chemo inside their own private practice, inside their own office. For example, when you go to the oncologist, you know, you're in a treatment room with about 15 other patients. You know, if you have cancer, they put you in this room, a lot of people sitting there, and the nurses administer the chemo, but what you don't realize, the oncologists are just, are, they're allowed to jack up the price of the drug and charge it to your insurance company, and he or she pockets the profit. And who's going to question an oncologist? What insurance company or Medicare or anything else is going to question the doctor? What are saying, the two scariest words in the English language? Cancer, death. Yeah. Cancer, death. Well, so, uh, but even still, I mean, the, the worship, sacred aspect that doctors have in our society is that whatever they say is God's truth. Now, I'm not denigrating doctors at all. My whole family's doctors, but they have this aura around them that whatever they say goes. So you get a cancer patient, a breast cancer patient, which is a hard tumor, and they put them on the standard of care, the chemotherapy, and and maybe even a a bone marrow transplant. They'll, They'll do a biopsy, then they may do a lumpectomy, and then they may do a much more cutting, And simultaneous with this, they're going to want to institute chemotherapy right away, even though it does not work on breast cancer, Mm -hmm. and then radiation to follow it up. You know, that's the normal sequence. There are variants to that. Sure. Sure. But but you're going to get the chemo in an oncologist's office in the room that you were talking about where there's a bunch of people. Well, you you have to think about it. I mean, they don't make money. They don't make millions of dollars off of office visits diagnosing people that come in. No. No. They, they have a really strong lobby in Washington to keep this procedure alive. Yes. And they're not even required to tell the patients that they're making money off the cell of the chemo in their office. And, you know, like I said, in many cases it doesn't even work. So it's all very quietly done. Oncologists are making a fortune out of this. I mean, if you have 15 patients giving, getting Avastin or another chemotherapy drug, it's $10,000 a month per patient. You can do the math. 
And the fact that it doesn't work very well, that's a secondary issue. It brings in the money. Yeah, now there, there are many well-intentioned oncologists. I mean, I know that. I had one as a friend. When I was in chiropractic college, my wife at the time worked in an oncologist's office, and he was a, he was a friend of the family. I mean, his two oldest sons were the best friends with my two oldest sons through high school. And as a way of helping out this poor college student you. with a bunch of kids, he put my wife to work in his oncology clinic. And I appreciated that. We all appreciated that very much, but the story was always the same. There was a treatment room with you know 12 to 15 people on gurneys or recliners or upright in a comfortable chair, whatever. And they're all receiving these intravenous solutions of chemotherapy drugs. And the turnover was huge, as most of them, of course, eventually died. <laughs> but the room was always full. Yeah. And when a patient died, uh, my wife at the time, they never referred to them as dying. Oh. They, they had a pile of their files until they could be disposed of. Uh, that they were, it was something like, well, they're on vacation. They, they did not use the word dead, death, or dying in that oncology clinic. They weren't allowed to. They weren't allowed to. Because there was the probably too much word. of it. Yep. Yeah. There's also a lot of collusion with the drug companies and the FDA. We all know about the revolving door that exists between our government and the drug companies. For instance, the CEO of a pharmaceutical company will move over to the FDA and supervise the development of a drug that their former employer is promoting and this works the other way around, too, where officials in the FDA or in the CDC will suddenly become the CEO of a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, this isn't private information. I mean, it's announced in the news once or twice, then never mentioned again. Yeah. I mean, you can Google this and you can, you, you can see the revolving door that I'm talking about. In fact, books have been written on it. Yeah. And all of that exists just to get drugs approved that cost a lot of money, which oncologists can charge to the insurance companies and then, of course, make a fortune off of it. The chemotherapy regimes can cost fifty to $100,000 for a single patient, let's do even that again. if it doesn't let's, work. Let's do that word again. It's regimens, not regimes. Okay. The chemotherapy regimen can cost fifty to $100,000 yes. for a single patient, even if it doesn't work. Yeah. So there are treatments for pancreatic cancer chemo treatments that are not effective, and those can cost fifty to $70,000. Yeah, and, and the usual life expectancy for advanced pancreatic cancer is anywhere from 9 to 12 weeks. They'll tell them that right in front. Well, you got it best 9 to 12 weeks. We're going to try using this chemo on you. It's a hard cancer. But it isn't going to work. Yeah. So they do what's called the Whipple procedure. You can Google that too, just like Whipple, W-H-I-P-P-L-E. Uh, it's a very aggressive surgery for pancreatic cancer, and very few people really are appropriate for that. Very few patients, I should say, are really appropriate for that kind of surgery. And even the group that it is appropriate for, which is about 25% of them, that undergo Whipple have any kind of a long-term survival. 75% die pretty quickly, like the 9 to 12 weeks that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. But Medicare allows a surgeon doing a Whipple procedure to be paid $31,000 just for that surgical procedure, whether the patient survives or not. Yeah, that doesn't include the cost of anesthesiologists or the nurses or the hospital stay or the food or the intravenous drug. It's just the doctor's fee for that surgical procedure, $31,000 that they pocket. It takes two to three hours. You do one a day for five days, and you figure... Well, you can do the math. You make about $150,000 a week. Yeah, and there's a lot of docs out there in the community hospitals that are doing Whipple's procedure because there is an increasing level of pancreatic cancer. And it doesn't work for most patients. And patients have no idea what the cost is. I mean, Medicare, which is known to be cheap, yeah. is allowing $31,000 for a few hours of surgery that really doesn't work that well. So the cost of cancer therapy is enormous. It's estimated that chemo, just chemo by itself, could be costing up to $100 billion a year in the U.S. alone. Wow. In terms of gross income. $100 billion? I mean, that's a lot of money. And who's going to stop that gravy train, regardless of whether or not it works? Now, we bring this to your attention because, as we're sure you know, it is money that rules health care in America. In all of the other industrialized Western nations, health care is provided by the government. These governments will only pay for what is tried and true and works. Yeah. They don't waste your money. Now, we're not chemo bashing. I want to get that clear yeah, here. Make... Because in a few cancers, chemo can be very effective. Uh, who was the bicycle guy? 
Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong, testicular, testicular can- cancer. Mm-hmm. Chemo happens to work on testicular but cancer. But that's not the point. And what happened when it got rid of his testicu- testicular cancer, it became front page news all around the world. Chemo destroys and cancer. We think, and so we think, oh, we got to use chemo then on cancers. Yes. I mean, but, it makes sense. But what we're talking about, that's not the point. Yeah. The point is, is that there is a policy that is allowed to oncologists but denied other medical specialty, specialties that has created a juggernaut that we all pay for in the end with exorbitant insurance costs. Yeah, because think about it. You, you charge Medicare when a patient comes into your clinic. And for what you do... Which pays almost nothing. $17. $17. $17 is all you will get versus $31,000 for a procedure that may or may not work for pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And bam, they're Boy, just Boy, did I ever pick the wrong <laughs> Yes, you did. <laughs> and what you do, I mean, changes lives. It gives people back their lives. It frees up their nervous system, just that little thing, to yeah, function. Just that little thing. To function properly. And you get $17. From Medicare. Well, that's actually the patient reimbursement. <laughs> they pay me a certain amount, and then Medicare oh, sends them a check I know, you're for $17. Because you're a close... In some cases, it could be $19, though. <laughs> so I don't want to cheat Because you're a cash them. practice, or yes. we are a cash practice. Right. But, but if we were just straight Medicare... I mean, uh, yes, I would get... Yeah, yeah we, we, we couldn't live. So, in recap... What we're trying to do in this quest of ours to rip open a hole in the universe and bring true healing information to the masses, and I'm talking foundational healing, is for you to become aware of what's going on in our medical system. We're not saying chemotherapy in which the doctors are making millions of dollars is bad. No, not at all. I mean, it can be very helpful, even curable with certain blood cancers. (laughs) Yes, it can. But it is not nearly as effective, and dare we say, maybe even hurtful, with other types of cancers, hard cancers like tumors, but is it's it's being prescribed continually for all cancers. All cancers. And bone marrow transplants have a very, very low success rate. Very low. And can cost over a million dollars per patient in some cases, and we are all paying for that. So what we need is an understanding that all disease should be handled with foundational nutrition along with chemo if need be. Yes. And we all need to take control of our own health. Now, let me explain something, too. I think we forgot. When you go sit in those chemo chairs and, you know, you're all sitting there with 15 people, they're feeding you chocolate. They're feeding you candy. The food of cancer. Yes. This, yeah. this is how far we've come from yep. the forbidden, true foundational healing that they literally are feeding you the very food, or I wouldn't call it a food, but... The very substance upon which cancer thrives, because cancer is a very primitive cell. Yeah. Cancer isn't taking in fats and amino acids and carbohydrates and all. It's taking in the simplest form of energy it can get, which is sugar. So... That just blows my mind. It just blows my mind that we're... That you go in there in this, you know, it it just... it, It kills me. And then the other thing is that... It's like going into... A center for addiction control, addiction help, and they're passing out opioid drugs. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I just have no words for it. Yeah. And then, then, and then, many times they'll you'll be diagnosed with cancer, and they'll say, "Hey, let's just wait and see," or or your tumor. We're not sure. Or you know, like let's the um, the uh, testimonial we have from a patient yeah. that they found a mass on his tumor and on his liver. On his liver. What did I say? On his tumor. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Clearly upset. So, you know, a mass on his liver, and he, he, the the doctor said, "Let's wait for a year, and then come back and look at it." And he was like, "I don't have time to wait." So he did gaps with us, yes, and took our long life energy enzymes, and in six weeks, it disappeared, it was gone. vanished. Yeah. Now we're not claiming that our product did that, but good foundational support of your immune system, yes, and the pancreas that scours the body for. You know, mute. pancreatic enzymes. Yeah, the, the, the scour, scour the, body. the body. Yeah, not the pancreas itself. It doesn't. Walk yeah, around. if you do a blood test, there are very powerful pancreatic enzymes in the bloodstream all the time. All the time. And there's no food in the bloodstream yeah, that needs to be there? digested. Yeah. it's in the alimentary canal. Yeah, but so it's there. When you're not eating food, your pancreas spits out these pancreatic yeah. enzymes that scour the body for mutated cells, stem cells, mind you, and gets rid of them, and you don't even know. Yep. So what? 
good nutrition, foundational nutrition, you know, that's the thing. There's no money in it, but that's the thing that true healers would do. Whoa, you've got a mass on your liver. Let me refer you to somebody that has training in this because I have none. And let's get your immune system boosted and built and strong right. and healthy. And, and can, then let's come back six months from now and take a look at your liver. They can liver. put a nutritional profile together that will definitely support the liver's ability to heal itself. And everything, yeah. So. You want to start with if the doctor that diagnosed okay. you. So if the doctor that diagnosed you with cancer immediately recommends chemotherapy, Listen to him or her. Yes, listen to him. But know that you can take charge of your life and your treatment. And certainly be aware that the amount of money a doctor is making by recommending chemotherapy is substantial. Just keep that in mind. I mean, it's interesting, but you've got to stop and think about it. As you said earlier, a few minutes ago, how does a cancer doctor make all these millions of dollars? Well, it's not off of office visits because they don't see nearly as many people a day as we do. No, we see And not by so. recommending surgery because many oncologists don't do the surgery. They send them out to surgeons to have these things done. Exactly. They make the millions off of recommending and then administering inside their clinic the chemotherapy. And, you know, we didn't realize this. We, we didn't really know. I mean, you maybe did because your, your former wife worked there. But now you know and we know. And you have choices. Let me tell you, my brother, when he was the medical director of the largest HMO in Utah, where he just retired from last year, told a story where they laid off a bunch of high-ranking directors. They had to cut costs and all these um, administrators and management and everything else. And one of the guys that got laid off was an oncologist by training. But he told my brother, he just shrugged his shoulders as my brother told the story and said, hey, it's okay. It's okay, they got rid of my position. I'll just go back to private practice. I'll make more money. And of course, I'll never run out of cancer patients. And speaking of never running out of cancer patients, and this is so sad, we are not winning the war on cancer. In fact, we're losing ground, where in several states, cancer has now surpassed heart disease as the number one killer. Not because heart disease is getting less. It's because cancer deaths are getting more. And as we have reported before in other podcasts, and is public information, cancer is now the number one killer of children up oh. to age 15 from a non-accidental cause. That is just incredible. Cancer is the number one cause of death of children. Yeah, I have no words. So let me read a little bit, just a couple of paragraphs from this, this article about how cancer is now surpassing heart disease. After more than a century as the leading cause of death in the United States, heart disease is being surpassed by cancer in many states, according to a recent study. Heart disease replaced acute diseases as the leading cause of death in the early 1900s as a part of the epidemiological transition, which marks a change in what kinds of diseases are most deadly based on societal changes. Yeah. The new study sought to break down state-specific mortality patterns around the country, controlling for age because, you know, more people live in Utah. More young people. Yeah, more young people. More young people live in Utah and more old people in Arizona and Florida. Um, The data revealed that over the course of the past two decades, heart disease has fallen below cancer as the leading cause of death in 31 states. Yeah, now I've mentioned this before in other podcasts that a patient I take care of for headaches And I'll see her once, twice, maybe three times a year. Uh, She used to be a nurse in an oncologist's office. And so we'd talk about the success they'd have with blood tumors like the lymphomas and leukemias and multiple myeloma. And when I ask her about hard cancers that showed up in their office for chemotherapy treatment like brain, lung, breast, pancreas, ovarian, uterine, prostate, etc., her immediate remark brought me up short. She said this, oh, they're goners. Wow. Like, like I had said, gee, I like your shoes. Where'd you get them? Oh, I got them at Nordstrom. I mean, it, it was like that. Oh, they're goners. But not for the leukemia lymphomas. No, not for the soft blood cancers. Wow. So, you know, we wish we could end this on a happier note. Yeah. And, and it might be this, which is the movement in cancer therapy to immunotherapy. Yeah, getting your own body to recognize the presence of a tumor or mutated cell and destroy it the way it happens every day in the rest of us who've maintained b- being free of cancer or a cancer diagnosis. Now, this would require building up and sustaining the health of the pancreas and the thymus and the spleen and the bone marrow. And the gut. Yeah, you know, that makes up, the, especially the gut, <laughs> yeah. that makes up the immune alliance. And we refer to you to podcast 136 
further, uh, further expansion of the subject, the idea of an immune system versus an immune alliance, because there's no real immune system. Right. There's so many areas of the body that are involved with immunity. It's got to be built up and kept strong. So we have got to rip a hole. We have got to rip a hole in the universe, and ex- we're just trying to expose one forbidden tidbit at a time. And what doctors make on chemotherapy... We just thought you ought to know. <laughs> yeah. So if you like what we're doing at The Forbidden Doctor, there's many ways to support us. You can give us five stars on iTunes or a thumb up, thumbs up on YouTube, you know, wherever you listen to our podcast. But please join the conversation for each and every podcast by leaving a comment on our website underneath the podcast. Yeah, we need more of those guys. So comment on these podcasts. Yeah, and you can also support the show directly with a donation at ForbiddenDoctor.com slash donate. Or you just join our family by going to our website and taking our free symptom survey. It's on the homepage. And one of our nutritional experts will consult with you on the results of your symptom survey and give you a recommended protocol to purchase which up to that point is no obligation at all on your part. You're never obligated, actually. But anyway, up to that point, it's free. And if you've already helped support our podcast, then thank you, thank you, thank you. You make it all worth it. Yeah, now many of you may be finding us for the first time. Keep in mind the protocols on our website and what we're talking about are only available to logged in users. But you can create an account instantly by taking our free no obligation symptom survey. And remember, you'll also have the opportunity to take a free to have a free 30-minute phone consultation. So, understand this survey saves you money in the long run because you're not taking supplements you don't need and all of this again at no charge to you. And if you decide to purchase the recommended supplements, you can get them at a 10% discount if you sign up for our text blast. Or you can also Always call our office at 801-523-1890, and they can help you sign up for the text blast or sign up for our VIP where you get 20% off or just ask or answer any question about the supplementation and the Forbidden Doctor's mission. You know, I'm old enough that just calling the number (laughs) is very attractive to me. Yeah, let's just make it simple. Mm -hmm. You can call. You can ask them, how do I do this again? Let's just make it simple. 801-523-1890. Yeah. And, and this will help us keep promoting and developing the Forbidden Doctor's mission, which yeah. is revealing the health secrets they don't want you to know. And remember, your patronage of our offers keeps this podcast on the air. The statements made in this podcast about specific products have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided or any information obtained on or in any product label or packaging or this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professionals. Yes, so thank you for listening to this forbidden information in our forbidden podcast. And join us next time for another in-depth discussion of forbidden knowledge. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Forbidden Doctor podcast. If you are curious about long-life energy enzymes or ageless thyroid, you can purchase them without a membership from our website at ForbiddenDoctor.com or get our enzyme formula from Amazon.com by searching the full term, Long Life Energy Enzymes. Don't forget to take our obligation-free symptom survey to get a free personalized supplement protocol recommended for you by Dr. Jack, Mary, or one of our qualified nutritionists. Take the survey... Get a call from our nutritionist to create a protocol and a patient login. Then use that login to see your own personal protocol along with any favorites you've saved from our symptom library. Remember, our website and our clinic are here for you always.